Saladin Allah comes to us as a visitor experience specialist from the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center. The mission of this museum is to reveal authentic stories of freedom seekers and abolitionists in Niagara Falls that will in turn inspire visitors to recognize modern injustices stemming from slavery and to take action toward an equitable society. Saladin is the third great grandson of famed freedom seeker Josiah Henson, whom Harriet Beecher Stowe used for Uncle Tom's cabin. In 2018, a permanent life-size display about his family's heritage was included in the Freedom Gallery at the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center. In 2019, he was the recipient of Niagara Falls Martin Luther King Jr. Civil Rights Achievement Award. In addition to working with the Heritage Center, Saladin is an elementary school educator and a public art coordinator for the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area where he lives. Probably his most important role is that of father of three girls. Here is Mr. Saladin Allah, Harriet Tubman, and the Freedom Seekers. Thank you for that introduction. Um, in regards to the three daughters, you see that I don't have any hair right now, <laughs> right? Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for having me here uh, this, this morning, um, all of our guests who are online as well. Um, this is a very important um, time right now that we're experiencing, not only in the world, but this represents the 200 year anniversary of the birth of Harriet Tubman. Um, when we were coordinating this event with Mary, she was telling me about the service on Sunday morning, and she's telling me that uh, the service ends about 11, 11.30. And I was under the impression that I was gonna be speaking after the service, but she was like, no, the service is like an hour. So I grew up in a Baptist church, and the altar call to prayer is an hour, <laughs> right? Um, and as a part of my culture of the 5%, we have like universal parliaments and rallies where we gather for four hours to six hours easy. So one of the challenges with just being with here, you here this morning was to think about like, how can I succinctly explain the, the purpose and the role of a, of a figure like Harriet Tubman within this short period of time. Um, she was five feet tall, but she was a giant amongst men and women. Um, she was born under the name of Araminta Ross on the eastern seaboard of a plantation in Maryland that was run by a man named Edward Brodus. Um, one of her most earliest experiences in terms of being an enslaved person was at the, f the age of five years old where she began to be um, leased out to neighboring plantations. So to kind of put that in context for you, here you have a young girl being put in that vulnerable position in that dangerous situation at the age of five, which by today's standards would be like our children going to kindergarten but she's being leased out to plantations to work at the cost of $60 a year, which is equivalent to about $1,700. So that's how she started her life in terms of plantation life. This incident disabled her for the rest of her life and caused brain trauma to the extent where she suffered epileptic seizures as well as blackouts for the remainder of her life. But this is also the incident that she ascribes to the visions that she started to receive, the visions, the dreams, and what she saw as premonitions from God. Now, to be clear, the God that she was talking about wasn't the white man's God. It wasn't the enslaver's God that was instructing slaves to obey their masters and the gatherings that they held on Sunday mornings in the broad daylight. She was speaking about the God of the invisible institution, the God that her and her people worshiped in the backwoods at night when the enslaved enslaver was asleep, the type of God that they prayed to, to have a poor harvest that year, or that sickness would fall upon the home of the enslaver. This is the God that represented the seedlings of what came to be known as black liberation theology. 
the type of God that gave them endurance to live this type of plantation life, the courage to raise up in armed rebellion, as well as the wisdom to actually escape. That was the type of God that she started to get these premonitions from. Eventually, when she got in her older age, she established the Harriet Tubman Institution for the Aged, which actually provided assistance to elders and people who were physically and mentally sick for free. This is something that she did in her, old, in her older age. Um, Auburn, New York is where she eventually settled in 1859, but during the Civil War, Harriet Tubman was the first woman to lead a large military troop in Beaumont, South Carolina. And these troops were 170 in number and they were successfully able to free over 700 enslaved people. So just thinking about some of the different aspects of who this, this woman was, it speaks to the multi-dimensions of who she actually is. You know, it's, it's very difficult to really cover her in such a short period of time. But one of the things that I encourage all of you to do who are listening is to do further research on who she was and why she is significant. You know, many of my people see her as more than just an ancestor, but honor her as one of our matron saints. Um, when she led that military troop to liberate over 700 people, in South Carolina, there was a news article that named her the Black She Moses. And that is one of the names that she carried for the rest of her life. <laughs> 